Hi, I'm Chris Sikora, and I'm going to take you through exercise one inside Creo Parametric 6.0. And today what we're going to take a look at is building this part that you see right here. And right now it's in the rendering mode. I'm going to turn that off. And you'll see some of the features that it has on it. We have a, a through hole. We have some chamfers as well as fillets. Uh, actually, uh, in Creo, they're called rounds, but in different systems, you might have been, heard them referred to as radii, blends, billets, and so on. But in uh, Creo, they're called rounds. And we're also going to shell this out. As you can see here, it's going to be a thin walled part. And so let's begin. Now, first of all, if you'd like to see, there's a, actually a PDF. A training guide that you could access if you just go to like a Google Chrome or whatever browser you're in, you could go to www.vertanu, V is in Victor, E R, T is in Tom, A is in Apple, N is in Nancy, U, X is in X ray, and then the one.com. And if you go to instructional manuals, You'll see here Creo Parametric 4.0. I'm in the process of updating it as I'm making these videos to 6.0. So as we click on there, this will, um, for the most part, it's very similar. It just needs to be updated. Uh, with this training guide, those of you who are actually taking this course through um, the community college I teach at, uh, there, you're, there's a sample syllabus inside there. Um, the intent of what you're going to cover or what we're going to cover. And you can see the evaluation scale, the points totals. So for example, your exercises, that's what we do together in these videos. Um, every week there's an exercise and that tallies up to 300 points and that's 30% of your grade. Your midterm, which will actually have a review video for your midterm, but you can't watch the review video as you take it, especially those of you who are online will figure out a way to work that, uh, as well as the final, there's a review video for that. And those are worth uh, 300 each. And then the labs, which come just after the exercise. So for example, lab one is in the book. The exercises are organized kind of like chapters. And so at the end of exercise one, you'll see lab one and then lab one B usually. There's uh, typically about two labs. As they get more complex, we go down to one lab per week. And those you should, how to be doing those on your own. Uh, remember when you get a job out in the real world, you're not going to have a video to show you how to do that job. So that's why I really recommend you um, do those, try those on your own. The videos though, I have a uh, video that continues after this. If, uh, if you, you want to fast forward, if you're stuck in the lab, you could always go there. And again, don't rely too heavily on the videos for the labs because I don't always use the proper dimensions. And those of you who turn in your work, um, that's where I'll check your work and find those dimensions are an error. And that it actually allows me to know that uh, those who are, might be struggling or relying too heavily on the videos and maybe uh, we can adjust some things to help you out. Okay, so that tolls to a thousand points and a thousand. So if you got 900 points at the end of the semester out of a thousand, you're in an A above that. Uh, 80 to 89, B, 70, 79, C, and so on and so forth. Now, the general course outline you can see here is covered in weeks. And like I said, there's an exercise for every single week. Required hardware. Well, now if you're taking it online, it's actually just make sure you have a Windows PC. And it should be 64-bit. The last version of Creo to actually support 32-bit operating systems was uh, in 3.0, which if that's the only computer you have, you can do 3.0. And I have a series of videos, not the whole series of those that you can watch, or else watch the 2.0 videos, which are very similar. Okay, if you need the software, you could actually, uh, this link is uh, needs to be updated. This is for the old software, what you can do, you can actually just go to uh, and Google it and you could type in Creo student and you should be able to find free software. Make sure you go into PTC, Parametric Technology Corporation, 
they're the uh, developers of this software and you could go there and get a student license now when you do register that as a student license be sure those of you who are my students to use your student email address that way you could get um, an extended license of this versus um, I believe you might only get a 30 day if you use a 30 day license if you use uh, like a Yahoo or a Gmail account but I'm not sure on that but uh, I, I think that might be how it is okay so looking here you can see there's also links to these videos here and it talks about each chapter and and you can actually see a little image of what we're going to cover usually the exercises. Sometimes I put a picture of the lab if it's interesting. And there's even a video how to make a CAD portfolio. So the labs, those of you who are taking my courses online currently, the labs, I encourage you to do those and turn those in at the end of the semester in the form of a portfolio and include your parts and your assemblies and drawings that you create as well. You'll have a very nice thick portfolio. Now, portfolio is like gold out there. Uh, when I used to hire people in industry, um, very few actually had a portfolio or else some of them might take a drawing or two from where they currently work or used to work. And it's like, uh, that's not good. Remember, those, almost all those are proprietary. So you don't want to take those things that work here. You actually will have a open source, you might say, a portfolio. You don't have to worry about uh, anything like that and so that shows how to, how to do that and I'll go through that in some of the videos and now here's the totals if you're wondering how this all tallies up uh, even in more greater detail so you see there's 11 exercises uh, e1 which is 10 points is actually uh, that's free 10 points if you as long as you do this that's extra it turns out to be extra credit later but the labs tally up to 15 for this uh, exercise 2 which is next week be 30 points and you can see they're all 30 points from then on and then all these um, the labs are between five to ten points apiece and i encourage you to do those labs and do them right after you finish the exercises if you can if you have time because uh I, what i've noticed over the years is students will forget what they what we covered in the exercise together and almost all the labs are based off of the actual exercise that you've just done so you could apply those things that you've learned to the lab to reinforce it in your memory. Okay, um, in the training guide, you'll see there's an introduction to Creo here, and this is the uh, 4.0 interface. The uh, 6.0 interface, and they just came out with 7 not too long ago, and I, unfortunately that's not in student version yet. Essentially with this, uh, you can see there's the model tree on the left-hand side, there's the ribbon up at the top, with the icons, there's view options. That's this bar right here, allows you to go to shaded, wireframe, or rotate, things like that. And then there's the origin, axis, center, X, Y, and Z. And there's three planes, front, top, and right, that intersect each other um, at that origin, which is your zero marker in space. And then, of course, this is the viewport area here. And we're gonna go through that. I'll discuss a little bit more in detail. Note with your mouse buttons. Now the mouse buttons in Creo are a little bit different than what you might be uh, exposed to if you've used other CAD systems. The left mouse button, no different. That's for selecting objects, drawing lines, sketches. You just click and you drag and you can make your lines or click on points to make the lines in between. The right mouse button, again, not anything really different here too much with the exception that I'll talk about in a second. It's for opening up context sensitive menus. Now, one difference here though, is you'll notice it says you must hold down the button for about two seconds when you right click. In most Windows applications, when you right click, you usually get the pull down menu or little menu to expand immediately. This one, just give your, give it a couple seconds while you hold that right mouse button, mouse button down for it to turn on. And I'm not certain why that is, um, it might be from Creo's roots and things like that, because Creo is one of the original, I mean, it is like the original parametric modeler. It came out in 1987, and they've been uh, updating it ever since. Extremely powerful software, um, and it's the, you might call it the granddaddy, but yet with the updates that they add to it, it's, uh, it's quite a nice package. Could pretty much, I'd always talk about how back in the day when I used to use it in the, 
uh, 1990s, it was one of those softwares that could pretty much do anything we needed to do. So um, very powerful. Now the center button option is used for rotating, so we'll see how that works. Um, also, believe it or not, dimensioning. You're going to have to click on points and then middle mouse button, and it will drop the dimension in. So that's kind of, that's where it's different. And if you can remember that, it takes a couple times, and you'll you'll see how it works. And then zoom in and out with scrolling that works too. It also cancels commands. So like if you're drawing lines and you have line chain, you can middle click and it will end the line chain, which is actually really nice. And a uh, control key and pan or for pan. Oh, I'm sorry, pan when holding the shift key in the middle wheel button if you hold it down. Okay, so um, now there are options and properties and that's what we're gonna cover next here. There's the um, options menu. Let's do that. Make sure you have this up on the screen. Go to file and go to options. And there's a couple locations for options inside Creo. So for general part modeling and such, we're gonna look and we're gonna see this. This is pretty much the main part that you're gonna find inside Creo. Now, later on with drawings, it has its own little area that we'll go into for setting up font styles and arrowhead styles and things like that. But we'll cover that in exercise six. But let's take a look here. So the environment, you'll see you could set on a sound bell for prompts and messages. And um, I'm not gonna turn that on, but let's go to, uh, and you have a working directory. So for example, you could set it up wherever you want your um, files if you wanna save them. Okay, then system and appearance. Now you have here, there's a default theme. If you have the little arrow to the right of it, you'll see light theme and a dark theme. It depends on your preference. These are really nice because you can click on them and it sets everything up. You don't have to go change the line style. You don't have to change the the solid view style. They're, they're pretty decent. I'm gonna go with the default theme though. And I might recommend, I recommend to you maybe sticking with the default theme, at least through this first exercise till you familiarize yourself with the interface a little bit better because there will be times I'll say, okay, now you're gonna click on that green, glowing green dot. And if you set yours differently, yours might actually be orange. And so it might be a little confusing for you. So that's why at least the first day, I would recommend keeping it in alignment with what I have. And uh, you can see there's the interface start and there's system colors, black and white, white and black, custom. And let's move on here, model display. Now I actually like the default model orientation to be an isometric and that's a preference. You might wanna set it to isometric. I'm gonna set mine. And there's actually a show the orientation center, which I could show you how to turn that on and off later. Um, as we move down here, there's a uh, set shade quality. Now, uh, depending upon your graphics card, you may want to keep it at the default settings right now. Later on, you could go back and adjust it and make it very smooth and clean looking. You could see when you saw the model up earlier, I have it just set to a quality of three. I'm on a 1080 monitor. So it's not even 4K, but uh, it looked pretty darn good. So it, I would leave it at that for right now. But again, you could go back and adjust that. Also, there's the shade, very small surfaces. So if you want even finer details, you can do that. Uh, be aware though, when you start adjusting some of these, your graphics card, especially if you're working on a tablet or something that might not be very powerful as far as graphics, it might have some issues with it. So it might be a little slow and that's the, the GPU performance typically, I'm not talking about the software, it's just the GPU and the OpenGL interface. Okay, let's go uh, to entity display. And I have uh, shade with reflections. I have that set to my default, but uh, shade with edges is actually very nice for learning the software because it will highlight the edges. And so it's very nice to see that. Tangent edge display, we'll leave that solid. Now, anti-aliasing, um, be aware again, if you don't have a, a decent graphics card, if you turn that on, it will look really smooth, but you may find it crashes. Um, at least that's, that was my experience in previous versions. Uh, usually when you don't have a graphics card, or like a, if, you're not, if you don't have a professional graphics card in particular, that might be an issue. So if you have a, a gaming card or something, it, but quite honestly, Creo works pretty well on most graphics cards, but if you set that up really high, 
again, there might not be support for that on your graphics card and you can run into issues. If you adjust this and then find yourself maybe having crashes, it will actually tell you usually like, you know, the OpenGL driver is having issues. That's an indicator that you set your graphics too high here for the red, for uh, smoothing it out. Because that's what anti-aliasing does. It smooths out the jagged lines, and makes them look beautiful and clear. But just be aware, if you don't have the graphics card to support it, you might have issues. Just go back, change that. Okay. Um, also, let's see here. I think we're pretty good on that page. Let's go to selection, pass that up. We're not going to go through every single one of these, just a few that are important. Go to Sketcher and one of my favorite settings, and I guarantee people who watch this online and they watch later videos or skip past this are going to be t uh, leaving little messages. Hey, how do you get the plane parallel to the screen? It's this checkbox. Make the sketching plane parallel to the screen. One of my favorite options. And mind you, once you set this, it'll remember that. Okay. And line thickness, sometimes I have students tinker with that. Leave it at 1.0. For right now, um, I've seen students in my classes like they make like super thin. You can barely see it, and they were working on it the whole semester, and I didn't realize it until I actually take a closer look. And it's like, oh gosh, you're punishing yourself with such low, very fine resolution on the lines. Okay, and for right now, that's pretty decent. Um, you could go through and look at some of the other options there, but uh, I'm going to go ahead and hit OK now. It's letting you know the configuration settings that you've made will be applied to the current session only. Hit yes. But you could save the configuration. And if you just leave it as config pro, you can just go ahead and hit OK. And when you bring it up, it should automatically access that configuration. If it doesn't, you have to you might have to direct it to it or put that in the proper area. Okay, so now we could go ahead and go to file new oh actually uh, cancel here one other area i'd like to show you is under prepare let's see here um, oh actually let's start a new part first let's go file new and this will appear you want part selected now note we'll never use the notebook in this class we'll never really go into edit the format which you can do we are going to use drawing. We're not going to use the manufacturing module in here, which uh, it's very powerful. But we're not going to use it. Uh, this is a CAD class. Uh, we, we will use assembly. So parts, assemblies, and drawings are the typical ones we're going to use. And we'll even use a subtype of sheet metal near the end of the semester just to show you how that's done. So solid, but for the most part, it, all, it will always be solid. Let's go ahead and name this. Name it, label it capital E and one. And use default template, that's fine. Hit OK. And let me bring my window over here. OK, now you can see the part file, the, the browser tree here, a model tree. You have right top and front planes. There's your origin. Let's go ahead and we're going to sketch on the front plane to start off. Now, Creo allows you to select the plane first and start a sketch. Or you could select the feature you know that you want to create and then select the plane. So it's really quite nice. It gives you either or options. And eventually, the more fluid you get with this, you'll find yourself probably picking out the feature first and then going to the plane. Uh, but in the beginning, what I find is new users typically like to start with the plane. Now, what is the plane? The plane is basically your sheet of paper that you're going to start sketching on. And when you decide how you want to sketch it, if you have a concept or some sort of drawing, like let's use a phone here, this is the front. And that if you're going to sketch this profile, you would sketch on the front plane. If you're going to sketch on uh, the right side profile first, you would select the right plane and draw this profile. And the same goes with top. So if you're drawing the top, you would be drawing that profile. So that's kind of the logic behind it. But don't put too much effort into it. Sometimes parts don't have a very clear front, top, and right. And as long as you understand or have awareness of spatial ability inside the software, it doesn't matter where you sketch it for the most part. There are some instances where it does. But um, don't 
put too much effort thinking that through. So I'm going to click on the front plane. Now you get the quick launch toolbar that appears here, which are basically the same icons that are up on the on the ribbon. Um, now here you could start a sketch and S is the fast key for that, or you could go directly to extrude if that's what you know you want to do. But learning the software, we're going to start with the sketch first. Now it will leave a little fragment of a sketch extra, uh, listed on our uh, model tree, but it's not a big deal. So it's sketch. And now we're going to go ahead and you see it will give you the cross and it went parallel. We look at like it's bullseye center right now. And we're going to go ahead and start drawing the rectangle. Now, if you hit the little arrow to the right of rectangle, you'll find corner rectangle, slant, center, and parallelogram. Let's go with corner rectangle and move your pointer to the origin. When you get that little, it's like a whitish blue dot in the center, go ahead and click because you snap to that coincident. Now drag to the upper left, your geometry here, and click. And that now, now you have a rectangle. Now here's the thing. You want to, the dimensions are automatically put in there. Middle click one time. On your and middle click, what I mean by middle click is here's your mouse. Most of us have a wheel these days. Back in the old days, there were three button mice. But anyway, that wheel, instead of scrolling it, which zooms in and out, push it like it's a button. So watch, just click. And then what you get on your screen, look at this, you now have dimensions. Now it's the template is spread out very far. It's very large. We're talking 117 inches. Now you'll also notice as I float over the dimension, you get the dimension and tells you SD zero is equal to 117.52. Yours might be different, remember, because we, we arbitrarily just dragged it out. And there's parentheses that say weak. Now there's weak, strong, and locked dimensions. When do you use them? When does it not matter? Quite honestly, Creo doesn't make you or doesn't force you to make everything strong or locked. But before a part, as I always tell my students, goes into production, you want them at least strong. Sometimes you want to actually send them to, stro uh, to locked as well. But for the, that's kind of on the more rare side, what I'm going to show you in this class. But um, to get this to be strong, basically, you have to address it. You have to double click on it. And now this needs to be three inches wide. So double clicking on the actual numbers, you get the actual digits there and look at all those decimal places, how the precision is incredible. But we just actually want it to be three inches. Now, when I'm teaching this, I'm not just teaching you the software so that you understand how it works. I'm teaching you to be expert at it. And one of these the suggestions I'm about to make is um, I used to hire people. I've been using this software, like I said, the first time I used it, it was in the mid nineties. And what I would catch when I would hire people, I'd sit down and I'd say, rather than give them a full test and not watch them do it, I'd sit down and watch them do it. And if I saw them like sit here and backspace or click inside there and backspace up on it, they'd be like, Oh, they, they're not, they're not expert. They're very novice, but here's what looks expert. If you just, instead of backspacing on it, notice it's all selected in black. Just type the number you want. And don't, like if it's three inches, don't type 3.0000. That's a waste of time. Just type three and hit enter. It automatically puts the trailing zeros in. Now those trailing zeros, by the way, you could have the precision set higher in the options menu. That was another area, but we're gonna leave it at two decimal places. Remember. Um, actually, minimum should be three decimal places nowadays. Um, um, some places work in millionths of an inch. Um, and we're working in inches here, by the way. And I want to show you how you can set it to inches or metric in just a minute. But let's first get this one addressed. Now, now I change that. Now, as I hover over and I, I drag it out, you'll see in parentheses it's strong. Also, as I click off of it, the colors now change. It's actually, uh, it looks like a dark purple. Whereas the weak dimension is still like a light blue. So let's get that dimension addressed. Double click on it and don't backspace on it. I mean, if you want to do that, you can. I'll just tell you, it looks unprofessional. It looks like you really don't, you're not used to using the software. Type in five, hit enter. All right. And now what you could also do if you want, um, there's this refit. 
go ahead and click on that and it will zoom to fit. And then you could click on these and actually get the dimensions in even closer. And then I would just hit refit again right up here. Okay. There actually is a refit automatic in the options menu, and I'm going to find that a little later and uh, show you how to turn that on, maybe uh, in exercise two. But anyhow, uh, now we're just going to, we want to take this into the third dimension because it's just two dimensional right now. So hit OK up here, the green check mark. And now you could go to, uh, it should take you to the model tab automatically and find extrude. Click on extrude. Now I would rotate this. Now to rotate, it's all in this little mouse button, the wheel. Zoom in and out, scrolls in and out. But if you depress it, push it down and hold it, move your mouse left, right, up, down, or whichever direction you'll see, that's how you rotate in 3D. Now you have, you can see, since we're looking at it from the side here, there's a little drag handle. You could grab that. And for conceptualization purposes, that's how you could um, adjust it. Now you see there's a little ruler down here. It's uh, 0.78 or whatever my years might be different. You could double click on that and type in 0.5 and hit enter. Now notice up here, you could be selecting the same entities. Now typically when you're, it's very rare we work in surfaces in this class, by the way. So if it ever pops up in surface, that might be an indicator that you have a sloppy sketch. So just be aware of that. We'll cover that later, but make sure it's solid. And a sloppy sketch would be an open, by the way. And here you can see the depth. There's a variety of options there. We're going to keep it the default. Uh, 0.5, this is the flip switch to flip it backwards or forward. The little pink arrow, if you click on that, will flip it back and forward too. All right, and we're in good shape. Let's just hit, make sure it's 0.5, hit the green check and click anywhere off of it. And now you can actually see we have our rectangle. So, all right, so now I'd like to show you where you could actually change the units. Um, if you go to file and we could go to prepare, you'll see model properties, model properties here. You could assign a material if you go to change and they have legacy materials and standard materials. You could go in here and there's bronze, there's brass, um, 6061, aluminum, you'll see. And they also have the properties. Now these could carry over to the analysis portion as well. So be aware at any time you can also look up how much it weighs. So hit OK. Um, so there we could actually um, adjust that. Now the units, you'll see change here and you'd be able to set the units to inch, pound, second, or there's, um, that's Creo default. Uh, you also have centimeters, gram second, millimeters, things like that. So this is how you could adjust it and change it. I'm gonna go ahead and hit close. And so those are very, uh, there, there's a variety of options there. We're not gonna go through all of them, but just be aware that that's there too, to change it in the, in the event that you need to. Okay, now we're gonna build on top of this surface. So. Uh, with the theory that we're looking at, just go ahead and select this face and go to the sketch tool. Now you could go back up here and find sketch. Either one's fine. And it will bring us parallel to the screen, which I love that feature. Go to rectangle and it's going to be corner rectangle again. It should remember from last time you click up there, click on this lower left corner. Oops. Let me try that again here. Click on that corner and drag this out. Now you can see my line thickness is rather hard to see there. I might actually adjust that, but bring this over to the right edge and you'll see it will snap to that edge. And that's automatically establishing a relationship. Now we saw earlier where we had a three inch and a five inch dimension constraint. It. There's two forms of constraints inside Creo. There's those dimensional constraints and then there's relations, which are, are, are they actually don't call them relations here. It's uh, constraints that you could snap coincident to a point. You can make something tangent to another entity. You could make um, parallelism and things like that between entities. And that extra layer of constraints combined with dimensional constraints 
completely constrains the model. And you're going to see some examples of how we do that. And that's our goal is to always make sure it's constrained when we uh, finish. Creo kind of does it automatically, but there's um, some really neat features here. So let's go ahead, click on this edge right about where I'm located, and then middle click, and you'll see another thing, this um, kind of purplish color indicates it's a water type boundary condition. If you don't see that after you middle click, remember I used the little, little mouse button, one click brings up the dimension. That would be an indicator that you have extra lines or it's uh, it's sloppy geometry where lines don't connect and there's maybe a gap. And you want to fix those gaps, especially if you're solid, solid modeling. Otherwise it won't let you extrude it the way you would expect. Okay, this is a weak dimension, so double click on it and let's change it to 1.5. Now, in the event you wanted to lock it, you could by clicking on it and hit lock. Um, the reason you might want to do that during conceptualization, sometimes you can pull and tug on these corners and they'll move all over the place. Um, certain things you might not want to move or you might not want anyone to move. So you could lock it and then you're able to move the other geom geometric points for conceptualization purposes. It's really quite nice. Uh, let's go now and hit OK, and let's go to Extrude, rotate it a little bit. Let's set it up here to 0.5 again and hit Enter. Now, what it's going to do, it's going to actually merge the two bodies. Hit Enter and hit the green check. All right, now let's explore cutting a hole. Now there is a hole tool in here that has, uh, like as you see here, we're not gonna use that just yet. That's not until exercise four, we'll talk about that. That's a really nice tool. It has standard holes, like it has, uh, for example, counter bores and counter sinks and things like that, that you can just pick out and click where you wanna drop them. Now we're gonna, I wanna show you how to cut material, so we're gonna cut our own hole. So select this face right here, go to sketch, and we'll go normal two. Now go to circle, and in this upper left quadrant, click and drag out a circle and then middle click and you'll see the dimensions appear here. And I'm gonna drag the dimension out just so you can see them. Okay, and you might wanna do the same. So this, you want this hole to be actually 0.75 and that turned it strong. Now this dimension that was here, double click on that because this is the locator dimension. This should be one. We want it one inch off of this edge. Okay. Now here we have uh, this weak dimension here, but we don't want that dimension. We actually want one inch off of this top edge. And you might want this for manufacturing purposes. Maybe you don't want to base it off of the bottom edge. So what you do is you add a dimension. So go to the dimension tool. Now make sure this one isn't strong or else you'll have a conflict. If they're two strong dimensions, they'll fight it and you'll get a little message, which isn't a big deal. You just delete one. But watch this. This will override that weak dimension. I'm clicking on this top edge. I'm clicking on the center point. And remember it was five inches in height. This is about four inches located. So it's um, it'll be one inch off the top edge. So make sure, make sure your pointer's over here on the left. And this is one of those moments too that once you know this little trick, it's not really a trick, it's just the way it works. Um, it, you realize uh, this is a bit different than most CAD systems. To drop the dimension, it's not a left click. It's actually middle mouse button to press once. And there it goes. So don't forget the middle mouse button. It's gonna take you a few times. Usually um, the first three times you'll try left clicking. It's like, wait, why isn't the dimension working? And then you middle click. And I've had students who came the first day they figured it out and then they um, they might have been sick the following week. They come back the, the week after that and they'd already forgotten about that middle mouse button. So just be aware, it's a little different. Let's type in one inch there. Now it is a uh, middle click and middle click also, if you middle click twice, it will exit you. It's almost like an escape key. It'll exit you out of the dimension tool. So you don't accidentally dimension something additional. Now you could take and move these dimensions and lay them out how you might expect to see them on a print. Now there's two reasons for this. Some offices are starting to go paperless. Um, believe it or not, when I used this software back in 1995, 
we were a paperless office, virtually paperless. We only made drawings at a customer's request, but we didn't really need it. We were making, uh, we were doing 3D printing. Uh, and now I thought we were unusual because no other company I knew of was doing that at the time way back then. But now a lot of companies from what I'm talking to my students who are working on out in industry, they're starting to say, yeah, we're trying to go paperless. So it's pretty neat. Okay. Anyhow, um, lay those dimensions out so that they're easy to interpret for the next person because change will eventually happen. Um, usually with these models, remember, because designs change quite often. First time you design it usually isn't the last. So hit OK. And I'll go to extrude. I'll rotate this a little bit. And let's use this flip arrow button. And it says the default option has been switched to remove material. Very nice. It's a little AI built in there um, or an expert system, if you want to call it that, that knows that it, it recognizes behind there, there was a solid. So really you wouldn't add material on material. So it flipped it. And this is the remove material button that you normally would have to hit if, if it didn't recognize that. Note that sometimes that expert system isn't going to recognize it if there's a, a strange way you're modeling things, which is common actually. Um, but one other thing, we talked about how change occurs in design. And there's something called design intent. Now, design intent is your plan on how you want this model update if it changes, which is highly likely. Now, imagine this hole. Right now, it's going 0.75 deep, and you're like, oh, it's cleared. It's only a half inch thick. What if a change comes down after this is all modeled? And someone says, let's make that one inch thick for the plate. Then you have to remember to go back and change the depth of that hole, too. So design intent is like thinking that through a little bit. And my new students don't think about it too much. I want you to just model and have fun and enjoy this. But as you get better, you'll start recognizing design intent. And I'm going to have several opportunities to mention it. But I find if I tell students right out the gate, like think about design intent when you're modeling, they could sit there for hours and not get anything done. So I implore you to just put it in the back of the head know that you're going to use it sometime, but right now just focus on the modeling basics here that I'm stepping you through. Okay. But anyhow, what can we do instead to ensure that that always goes through as a through hole? Well, right here, they have the quick launch. If we hit the little right of that next to the dimension, you'll see blind is just a blind depth. That's totally like, I want a half inch and that's where it's going to stop no matter what, but you have symmetric, which would go both directions. Okay, we don't need that because it's just cutting air on the other side here. There's um, to next, if there was something else that could stop at, at a certain point, it would. And we'll, we'll use almost, we'll use actually all these at some point in time in this class. Now there's through all. That's what we want in this case. So go ahead and select through all. And now hit the green check. And that will ensure if we ever make a change that they'll update. Let's test it. Double click on the side face you'll see the dimensions appear and you'll see there's the half, the, the half inch depth right here. You can double click on that and let's change it to one inch just to see what happens. Hit one and hit enter. Now rotate and look at that goes through. Okay. So very simple explanation for design intent. It does get even more in depth. People who've been using this for years, they'll make these models. Some of them who look at design intent as important make models that are so easy to update and change. It makes it easier for themselves. And if it gets given to a customer or someone else who needs to make a change or a manager, that's, that's going to make someone really happy in the future. And they'll say, wow, that, that person is really good. But again, don't put too much effort into it just yet. All right. Now to change it back, we could double click on that dimension again, or we could hit the undo button or control Z. Go ahead and try it. Hit undo one time. Don't go crazy hitting undo too many times because it will systematically undo everything you've done if you keep hitting it. Um, and I recommend that to students. I've seen way too many students in class who get in trouble with the, the, sol the software and basically they hit undo like 20 times and then there, there's no part. I'll come back and I'll help them get caught up again. And then I'm lecturing and all of a sudden they're raising their hand and they've hit undo like 20 times. So just be aware, don't hit, hit undo one time. 
make that a general rule. If it doesn't do what you want it to do, then pause and think about it before you hit it again. All right, so, um, because usually that means if it didn't undo what you wanted to undo, it's not gonna do it if you hit it another 10 times. All right, middle click, uh, let's go back to model. All right, so now what we're gonna do is we're gonna go to the round tool. So go ahead and click on round. We wanna put some rounds on this corner and this corner. So set the round, actually let's leave it at 0 0.01 so you can see how this works. It's really pretty neat. Click on this edge, okay? Now go ahead and change it to 0.125. Now with that, you'll see little yellow points Try grabbing the point and dragging it down and look at the dimension update. See if you get it to one inch exactly. Remember, you could type in the explicit value up here too. Now go ahead and select this edge. Don't add any more other than that right now. Hit the green check to apply. So those are rounds, the radiuses. It's like if you took a sandpaper on an edge and you rounded it off. Now we're gonna take a look at chamfer next. So chamfer is right below it. Go ahead and click on edge chamfer. And we have distance to distance or 45 degree angle to distance or a specific angle to distance. You name it, they have it here. Um, let's go ahead and change it distance to distance at 0.125. It'll round it to 0.13, but that's okay. Um, actually, internally, it will still maintain the 0.125. And at a 90 degree edge, that's going to make it 45 degrees. So technically we could do 0.125 by 45. It's up to you. Let's go ahead and select that edge right there and select that edge there. And you should get a preview. Hit the OK button. Notice that is a straight angle or 40, 45 degree angle. I guess straight wouldn't be the right word for that. OK, now rotate around and I want you to rotate. Remember, we're rotating with the wheel. You hold, hold the wheel down like it's a button and move the mouse left, right, up and down to, to move it similarly to how I have it currently up on the screen. Now we're going to use the shell command. Go to shell and set the shell. Do not hit enter. Do not hit the green check until you select the faces that need to be open. Otherwise, it'll shell it out internally and you'll only be able to shell it once. And if you don't know what you're doing, you're going to lock yourself out of shelling. Okay, but anyhow, let's set to point one. And I'll select this face right here. I had to click twice on it for it to wake up. And look at the preview. We're not done yet though. Now hold the control key for multiple face selection. So hold control down, don't let go. Now click on this face right here. And by the way, when I'm referring to clicking on mouse buttons, as I described earlier, I'll say, I'll just say cliff, click when I'm referring to the left mouse button, which is 90% of the clicks you're gonna make. The other 10% are the wheel as well as the right mouse button. But I'll always make sure, I'll say, sometimes you'll hear me say middle mouse button click. That's usually referring to the wheel. You're holding it down like it's middle mouse button. That's usually for rotate or ending a line chain. I'll make sure I say it twice to right click. So I'll say right click and I'll elongate it right click just so you realize you're not clicking on the wrong button. Okay, now uh, holding control still. Select this face and look at that. The faces we selected, we opened up. So you can now hit the green check mark. And there we have it. Okay, let's um, let's go to um, some different views. If you click over here, you'll see there's shading with reflections, shaded with edges, shading, no, no hidden. Go ahead and go to hidden line and you can see you kind of get a wireframe there. And there's straight wireframe. Uh, there's no hidden. Okay. Uh, it, there's also shading with no edges. You just see it like so. And then there's shading with edges, which that's what we've been using. And then there's shading with reflections, which is really uh, it's enhanced. Some engineers don't like all this, but others love it. So um, it's up to you if you want to see all those shadows and things like that. There's also rendering options. So you could click on this and there's ambient occlusion and scene background, uh, which there's not a scene background that you could really identify with this one. But you could leave ambient occlusion. Just remember that one slows down your graphics card. Those of you who have like a 
a very old laptop maybe or with a with not very good graphics turn that one off it, it might slow things down a little bit okay i can do it i have a pretty decent system that i'm running on uh, and that brings up something if you're wondering what i'm running on here um, there's a product out there it's free it's just cpu z cpu for central processing unit and z you could google it and you could install it on your desktop and i i just started it up and i'm going to bring it over to show you you could see what's inside the computer that you're running without having to even open it up okay in this case um this is the the feedback i'm getting from cpu z i'm running a amd ryzen 9 3950 in the lower right, you'll see it has 16 cores and 32 threads. Uh, some students ask, like, what type of processor should I get? What's the best thing? I'll tell you, most of the application runs on single-threaded performance. That means one CPU at a time. But for photorealistic rendering and some of the other features, a few features, um, take advantage of multiple threads. So if you're going to do a lot of photo rendering, things like that, um, Definitely get something with more threads. I mean, 16 cores, 32 threads, that's pretty high right now. That's uh, quite good. There are some with more, like the uh, Threadripper, I believe, is up to 64 uh, with 128 threads. <clears throat> but you're talking thousands of dollars just for the CPU. This computer I built also, if I go here, you can see the main board. I went with an Asus motherboard and um, the memory. I only went with 16 gigabytes. Now, 32 really is probably where you want to be. Um, as you can see, I'm getting by just fine. I'm just doing training videos. I'm not doing anything large. But 32 gigabytes or even more, depending upon how many, how large your assemblies are or how, how complex your parts are, might be helpful. And quite honestly, it's a low investment. If, for another 100 bucks, I could, I could double this RAM. So if you want, get more RAM, get 32. If you're doing this out of your house just uh, for school, 16 is going to be just fine. You're not going to need anything more. And remember, you could always update it. Now, the nice thing about this, you could go over here to this uh, the memory. It tells you what memory you have in there. But if you go to the SPD, this these are the uh, memory slots. Now, you'll see slot 1 I have open. Slot 2 I have that piece of memory there. Slot 3 I have open. Slot 4 I have memory in it. Don't always trust this. Open up your computer or your laptop or actually look for a video on it before you go uh, and buying the memory. Because I've trusted this before, like on a laptop, and I went ahead and I got more memory, and I re found out even though it showed four slots, there were only two slots, and both were taken with large chunks of RAM to begin with. There wasn't really a, much of an upgrade path. So just be aware, don't always trust the slot feedback. I've seen it where, um, in fact, I have a work, an HP workstation behind me with a 12 core processor and I have 32 gigabytes of RAM on that. And when I go here, I don't even see, like I see the slots, but they're all blank and I know every single slot's filled up. So there's sometimes it does weird things. So don't always trust this. Now the uh, graphics, the graphics card I'm working on is the AMD Radeon Pro WX3100. That's a, a, it's a modest card. It's around 200 bucks, I believe. Um, don't quote me on that, but uh, there's also newer ones. Uh, this one goes back a couple of years ago and uh, AMD actually sent it to me to use for these videos. And uh, I really like it. It's very nice. Anyhow, they have much higher end cards. This one's pretty darn good though. Four gigabytes of RAM and it's a professional. The Radeon Pro means professional. It supports, it actually has drivers that are certified and written for CAD applications. So as I was talking about before, when you adjust some of those settings, a lot less likely to have issues with a professional card than a gaming card per se. Now, those of you taking my classes, if you're just uh, taking this, your gaming card is going to be more than adequate, if not actually exceptional. But just be aware, if you're doing this for a living and working for a company, get a pro card. Pro cards also are more expensive typically than a gaming graphics card. Uh, but companies can afford it and it's worth their while to get it to prevent the issues that you might get with a non, uh, with a gaming card, for example. But 
Creo works really well with all graphics cards that I've experienced. Like I said, sometimes if you adjust some of the settings, you might have some issues. But anyhow, the Radeon Pro is, is a great one to get. Also, NVIDIA has a line, their Quadro line. They're, they're both up to par with each other. Excellent cards. They're on the pricier side. They're not very good for gaming necessarily. For light gaming, they're just fine. But for general, um, for CAD, outstanding. Well worth the investment. And they could go up to mass amounts. Like, and as far as memory too, be aware four gigabytes is more than enough. Two gigabytes is fine. I've even run with one gigabyte because if you're not, uh, if you don't have a lot of textures and things up on your models, which you can, which I'm about to show you how you can put textures on your models, you don't need the, the large amounts of RAM. Although you do want it for 4K. So um, if you have 4K displays, especially multiple displays, then you want more memory because it has to spread that out. But be aware, um, like on, on a single 1080p or 1080 screen, one gigabyte's gonna do you just fine. Two gigabytes for two screens, four gigabytes maybe for four or even more. Anyhow, okay. Um, <clears throat> now, what's really cool about this little CPU is that you can benchmark your system. Now, first of all, you could select a reference process you wanna compare it to. So for example, here's a Threadripper or there's the uh, Core i7-1070, which is one of the latest, not the greatest necessarily. Uh, it's it's up there. It's actually an exceptional processor, but they actually have a 1090, 900, 10900 that's out that's even faster. But let's compare it to that. Now here it's showing us the benchmark results that they achieved with that particular processor. Let's compare it now. And remember, this is multi-threaded. This is single-threaded. Most of what we do in CAD is actually single threaded unless you're doing photorealistic renderings or some other types of uh, like analysis most of it is single threaded so that's what you want to stress um, now what i do i just hit bench cpu you can see my cpu multi-threaded performance is actually almost off the chart there i'm gonna hit control alt delete and task manager and so we can actually see the performance and open resource monitor and this is just in Windows. You don't need anything to download for this. And here you can see all my threads in operation. Um, actually, they finished their little application, finished running. Um, and the test is done. So this processor, its single, single thread performance isn't quite as powerful as the Core i7-10700. But the multi-threaded, because it's just it's overwhelming, it has twice the threads, of course, it's going to be much higher. So um, you know, it really depends on your application. 520 versus 560 isn't all that huge a difference, but um, for example, um, i7-770, a 7700 processor from Intel, which is already a few years old, has the same single thread of performance as this processor that I'm running, which is just within the last year. So just be aware there's things to weigh and, and price like this processor I paid from um, was around 650 almost $700 the whole system I created here was about $1,500 um, so just be where I spent a lot but you could get a, a nice bang for the buck I've run this software on very little computers like um, netbooks not like a chrome netbook but a windows netbook with like four gigabytes of ram you can run it on. Is it going to be fast? Absolutely not. But for the parts that we do in this class, it's just fine. If you're going to do it for work, get something much more powerful. Okay. All right. And finally, I could go to about, and there's Microsoft Windows 10 Professional 64-bit. I'm going to go ahead and hit close. Okay. Now let's take a look at rendering this and adjusting this. So First of all, we could go to view. Think of it something you want to see, and view is another name for see. You have the appearance gallery right here. You hit this little arrow. And let's say, uh, let's look at some of these. If you hover over them, I'll tell you, like, here's polished aluminum. Click on it. Now, before you just click on individual surfaces, it says all here. Just so you know, in the lower right is a filter. So if you want an individual surface or if you want the entire part, uh, let's go to part. Let's have the whole part colored so click one time and then middle mouse button click one time and it applies the characteristics of that polished aluminum 
Now let's go to the appearances here. And here we have metallic gold. Let's see, is there a polished one? There's polished brass. Oh, there's gold polished. So I'm going to go ahead and select that. Now, instead of all, I'm going to select surface and I'm going to select this and I'm going to hold control now. Remember, we're selecting more entities and select specific faces and even the whole. I'm going to rotate. I'm going to select this side face too. Now, middle click one time and it's applied that gold to it. Now, you'll see the it's like uh, imagining as if it's sitting up like that. I want it actually more flat on a base. You would go to the scenes editor right here and you could select from different scenes. You can see there and go to edit scene. And here's the scene editor. Now, um, if you go to environment at the bottom, there's floor X, Z, change it to X, Y. And now the floor is on the underside there. And you could adjust the intensity, saturation, tinker with those if you like. You can turn off shadows if you don't want to see the shadows. And I'll leave my shadow off there. And then the background, there's different environments you could adjust the, the, the colors and things. And then the lighting, you could put new lights in by clicking on lights and add them. Tinker with it. Have fun with it. It's really impressive what it can do. Now I'm going to hit close. There's also perspective view. Perspective view is going to make it look realistic because when you take a photograph, perspective is given. Every, notice how the wall, like a back wall, seems to get smaller the further away you get from it. That's what perspective does. So it's a reality almost of life that we see everything, the perspective. With perspective off, the renderings look kind of fake. So just be aware, perspective is very important for that. Now, once you get this, well, you like it. Um, you can now go to applications and render studio. And I'm not sure, I don't think render studio comes with all licenses of pro engineer Creel. So just be aware you may not have the render studio. Um, it comes, it, apparently it comes in this version. So um, I'm going to hit render studio and this is the student version. And then we can actually see the rendering. And let's take a look at my microprocessor and see what's going on here. Look at CPU is up to hundred. Go to performance, open resource monitor. And this is where the app multi-threaded application is taking place. It's photo rendering that very high quality scanning through. I could even hear my fan increase in speed because the processor is heating up it's using more power. And look at that, all the threads are being used. So this is an application where multi-threading is very important. It's gonna, every one of those reduces the time that it's going to take to render it versus if you have an older processor that has four cores. Imagine it's going to take a lot longer to photorealistically render than you see here. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and cancel that. Now just be sure to turn off real-time render and I'm going to go back to the scene here and edit scene. I want to turn my shadows back on. So environment, shadow, close. and and sometimes it's nice to break the edges. Now there are options in here to do this. Um, like you could put additional fillets on and have a little fun with that. I'm going to go back to the model and go to the, and I keep calling them fillets. They're actually rounds here. So go to round and set this to very small, like um, 0 0.01. And like in this corner here to break that edge a little bit, you know, and you could select other edges. It'll give it more of a realistic appearance possibly. There is this built into it somewhere inside those options where it will automatically put fillets in for you. Um, but let's just go ahead and do it the manual way here where we have control. Now I'm going to go to application, render studio. Oops. Turn on. There we go. And real time renders on. And with the shadows, it gives it a much more realistic appearance. And the longer you let it sit, the higher the quality is going to be. Okay. But just remember to make sure you turn it off because it'll keep running in the background and it will slow down if you're continuing on to do additional parts. So I'm going to turn off real time render and just close that. All right. Now going back to the training guide here, you could see we have, um, when you get to the end of the actual lesson here, and here's the end of the lesson, 
on page 23. Oh, uh, there's the regenerate button, which if you ever make changes and you need to use that, the regenerate button right there is very useful for updating. It looks at the features on the tree and updates them in the event that one of them was changed. And uh, so it's, it's just nice to know. We didn't need it in this particular instance, but note that that's the way it works. Okay, now here are the two labs. Now, if you want, download this. If you hit download, and I'm doing it on Google Chrome, it comes up at the bottom left. I click on it, and now I could rotate it. So I could get to that page, and hit rotate, and let's get to those drawings. Because the drawings now, this is where I like my students to do these on their own not watch the video. So I recommend to my students, pause the video. Try doing this on your own if you could figure it out. When you get stuck, watch the video. Or when you finish it, watch the video and you'll see additional tricks that you haven't seen. So there's bonus material inside the labs. And remember the labs always coincide. Like if it's lab one, it's an exercise one video. If it's lab two, it's in the exercise two video and so on and so forth. Okay, so this is like a sideways F, and we see it's a two by three and a half, and then we have some one, 1 1.752, two and a half. Now, what I usually do is I, I have dual screens. You just can't see the second screen here. I'm gonna drag it over and use the dual screen. I'm gonna start a new model, and I'm gonna label this L1, and make sure it's part, and hit okay. And I gotta bring this over here and select the front plane, start a sketch, and go to the line tool. Now make the first line here to scale. So draw a vertical line out and I'll change it and it's supposed to be two inches in height. And now we could go back to refit, move that in a little bit. You could hit refit again and use your wheel if you want to zoom in and out. Okay, let's go back to line and draw the next line out and I'm going to make that that's needs to be a middle click twice by the way 3.5 and we could use refit again to center it and I'll go to the line tool again and drag this off and this one's going to be only like one inch but we'll put that in later drag this down about halfway click Drag this across. Notice those little green boxes with the horizontal and vertical lines. Those are relationships that we were talking about, that extra layer of constraints. Those vertical and horizontal relationships are being added automatically so that you don't accidentally have that twist at an angle. But if you want an angle, you draw the angle in like that. But anyway, I'm going to drag this out. This one aligns. I'm going to click. It made it equal. I don't know if you saw that. There was an equal symbol. Now, here's the thing. Be careful of the equal. You could turn this off as an option. But look carefully to the right of my pointer when you're drawing multiple lines for a sketch. There's an automatic equal. And it could be great if you like it. It could be if troubling sometimes too. Avoid getting that equal. See how I snap back a little bit? And the equal symbol to the right of my pointer disappeared. I'm going to click and drag it down now. And this one, I'm not going to go no, try and get no equals at this point. Click across here. Stay away from any equals. Click drag this down. Oh, darn it. You know what? I went a little too far. That's okay. Or not, I didn't go far enough, I should say. Click here. Now I'm going to middle click two times to end the chain. I need to trim that off. Now I could grab this and drag it over here, but I want to show you the trim tool. Trim is called delete segment. So click on delete segment and just watch this. I'm going to scribble through and it'll trim up to there. Now middle click. Let's change that dimension again to 3.5 because that's what it needed to be. And let's start any dimensions in our own way, the way it is on the print. So this line here, and does anyone remember how to drop a dimension? It's one of the mice buttons. It's the middle wheel. You have to click on it. All right, type in one. Now it's uh, we have a baseline dimension here. So from this left edge, click to this edge here, click, and then way up here, middle click. That's going to be 1.75. Now click on this edge here, to this edge here, and zoom out, and then middle click up here, and that's going to be 2.5. Remember, middle wheel click to drop that dimension. All right, now we still have dimension. Let's click on this line over here, middle click, and that's going to be 
0.85. Now click on this line to this bottom line and go over here, middle click, and that's going to be one inch. And we're fully defined. We've got everything. Let's now go to OK and go to Extrude. And we're going to go ahead and uh, we can drag that. It's only supposed to be a half inch. You can double click on this, type in 0.5, and enter. Now, I mentioned this before, and I'm going to bring this up now early on because some companies don't like you starting a sketch right away, like I just did there. Because take a look at this feature tree. We have sketch one, that's the sketch that we drew out, but then it creates another sketch here. Now, if you're working at a company that's dealing with millions of part files, each one of those little sketches that's doubled up, um, I was told, actually adds data and it could slow down the system when you exponentially calculate it. So here I'm going to I'm going to make the same model and I'm not going to put all the dimensions in, but with the extrude first. So, but first, um, we've got this one. Let's go to new and you don't have to do this part. I'm just going to show it to you. I'm going to go to part. I'm going to call this L1 an underscore test. Okay. Just to show you now, notice I put an underscore Creo remembers a granddaddy. Um, it likes underscores. I haven't tested it lately when, if you leave it out, but typically if instead of space, you want to put little underscores and if, uh, instead of space, otherwise it doesn't necessarily identify properly. Uh, it won't let you save it, but I, I, it might actually do it now, but I'm not sure, but I'm, it's just my habit cause I've been using it since 1995. All right. So L1 test, I'm going to go ahead and hit okay. And you can see what happens here. So I'm going to now watch this. I'm going to click on front, but I'm going to go to extrude first. And I'm just going to go ahead and drop what I had earlier. I'm not going to add the dimensions. Like I said, I'm just going to kind of draw something that looks like it. Middle click. Now watch when I hit OK. It automatically went to extrude. I didn't have eliminated that extra step because I pre-selected it. So it is actually a more efficient way of modeling if you could think that way through. Okay. Um, now watch this. I'll, I'll just apply it and look at the feature tree or the model tree. Com let's compare it. Let's drag this over. Here's the other model that has an additional sketch listed there. This one doesn't. So I show this to you because there are some companies out there that have been using Creo for years. They have millions of parts, especially like aerospace companies and things like that, um, where they want efficiency. They expect efficiency. This is the method you're going to want to use in that type of an organization. Uh, other companies, if it's like a small shop, you could do what you want as long as your manager says it's okay. But always just check. Some some managers don't even know that that's the case here. But just be aware, I wanted to share that with you as a side note. These are little things that are going to make you look very impressive to a potential employer if you could remember these little things. So. Okay, let's move on to the next lab. And lab 1B is this rectangle, which is three by five and one and a half inches thick. It has a cutout centered, uh, which is one inch deep. And then there's four holes that are half inch diameter spread out 0.75 off of each corner. This is a good application for either a pattern or a mirror. Let's show you a mirror feature in this case, and a sketch, not a feature, but a sketch. So select part. Let's go ahead and call this L1B is in boy. Hit OK. Get that over here. Now go to the, let's try it on the top plane. Let's see what happens. Click on the top plane and let's use that new method I showed you. Let's go to extrude because we know it's going to be extruded off of there. OK, go to rectangle to the right rectangle. We're going to use center rectangle. We haven't yet used this. So this is what I mean. This is bonus content you're getting. These are like smarter ways to design some things. Center rectangle. Get to the origin. Click and drag out your rectangle. Middle click twice. Change this. Double click three by five. Now remember, don't type 5.000. You're, 
if someone's testing you, they're going to roll their eyes and think that you're a novice. You want to look professional. Go ahead and hit refit. Uh, if you want, you can drag these down and hit refit again. Okay. <clears throat> now for mirroring. When you're mirroring sketch geometry, the ingredient that's required with the exception of what you want to mirror is actually a center line. So find the center line tool up here. Click on that. Click on the origin and drag a center line. Look at that, how it kind of goes off at an angle. Click to drag it straight up here. Click on that origin, drag a horizontal one. The reason we need two is because we're gonna make one and we're gonna mirror it across the vertical center line. And then mirror those two across the horizontal center line, making the four holes. At least that's the strategy. Let's draw the circle now. Go to circle. Stay away from this diagonal center line. You don't want that. Don't touch it because it, you could actually uh, snap to it and then you're locked in and you can't get the dimensions in unless you delete it and redraw it or delete the relationship. Click. Middle click two times. Um, this is beautiful. It gave us our point our locator. 0.75 on both of those. And then this is uh, 0.5. Now you could go through, and I used to suggest to my students, draw all four of those in each corner because it's good practice to mention. You could do that if you like. Um, you, you will actually learn a lot, but I'm teaching you an advanced technique right now. It's not really advanced. It's actually a basic technique, but it's a day ahead of time because normally exercise two, which we cover next week, we start looking at this. So it's a little heads up. All right. So here we have this. Let's go ahead and what we want to do is click, select what you want to mirror first. So click on that circle. You'll see the mirror tool appears. If it doesn't appear, click off of this a little bit and then reselect it. Now don't select the center point, select the outside of the circle. Go to mirror and then select the center line you want to mirror across. There it goes. Okay, now let's try that again. Now you can control select both of those circles. Or you could window select. Watch this. I could click and drag a fence or a window around those for selection. And now go to mirror and select the horizontal center line. You've got it. You don't have to add the other dimensions. Look at the little equal symbols. And these are uh, uh, symmetric constraints. So they all relate back to this. So if I change this one, like let's say I change it to one, watch they all update. Okay, so they're all tied together. So you just saved yourself a lot of time. Let's go to OK. And look at that. When you hit OK, it goes right to extrude. Again, that advantage of efficient modeling. Go ahead and change this to 1.5. Now, there's, by the way, there's a dozen ways you can model this thing. Model. I'm just showing you one way. OK, hit OK. Now select this face. And let's go to extrude again. You could start a sketch and go and draw first, but let's go to extrude since we know it's going to be a cutout. Go to rectangle. Find the center, drag this out, and snap it to this edge. Now, according to the print, this dimension needs to be one and a half inches. So double click on it, change it. Now, let's rotate it a little bit, see what's going to happen. Hit OK. Flip that arrow, but then drag this in. Remember, it only needs to go one inch deep. And I like to verify, because you have the eight decimal places trailing, um, you might want to just type in, in this case, point. Uh, actually, it's supposed to be one inch. So just one. Make sure it's zeroed out. Okay, there it is. Hit OK. Now, what I recommend doing with some of these parts, because these are great for portfolio pieces, not really just yet, but we can make them look a lot more complex than they really are. So if you want a portfolio and you want to make this look good, and I encourage this, my students, Dress it up a bit. You've learned about rounds today. Click on rounds and let's set the rounds up. Let's first click here, grab that little yellow dot, maybe make it a half inch and proceed to select all four edges. Okay, we'll rotate that, get that one there. Okay, we could actually even select these edges. All right, hit OK will make what looks kind of like a plug. And you could go and add chamfers now, go to the chamfer. Now let's say um, we want 45 degrees at a distance and we'll make it uh, 0.125 again. 
Oops. Right select this edge here. And look at that, we're making countersinks. All right. You could also chamfer this edge and this edge. And try that. And hit OK. You could put some little rounds in there if you go back to the rounds. And let's uh, put one in here. One here. OK. And oh, that's good. Hit OK. Now let's dress it up a little bit. Go to View, Appearances. And I really like the polished aluminum or polished chrome plate. Let's click on that. And let's put it on the whole part. Click, middle click. All right, looking good. Now we could go to, uh, let's go with the polished gold again. Or you could use whatever you like. I'm just uh, giving you examples. I'm going to go to surface and let's add some. Remember, you have to hold control, some enhancement, just so you can make out what these are a little bit better. OK, and maybe that floor middle click. Let's flip it around. Let's shell it. Go to the model, go to shell and select that face. And you can see it shells it out. Hit OK. And we've just taken a very basic part and you made it look pretty neat. Uh, now let's turn on perspective, zoom up, and let's photo render it. So you could go to applications, render studio, real time rendering turned on. And look at that. You've just made a beautiful part that's great for uh, a portfolio. Now, how to make a portfolio. There is a whole video on it, but I'm going to show you really quick. You could do it in Microsoft Office if you have Microsoft Word or um, LibreOffice, which is free. If you don't have Microsoft Word, you can try LibreOffice Writer. Again, you can just go uh, Google that and find it. <clears throat> and it looks just like Word. And I'm going to go ahead and type in E1 and L1 and L1B. And I'll put little spaces in between each one. OK, enter here. Now let's go back to Creo and find this one right here. Now I'm going to go ahead and hit Alt and print screen. And it should grab that. I'm going to turn off real time render because it, it's actually um, sucking up resources. Now here I go ahead and I hit Control V as in Victor. And I've just pasted that in here. Now you could also go and crop this and do all sorts of really neat things. There's a lot of neat tools inside here. So um, here's crop. If you right click on it, you'll find crop and then grab these corners and center it, click off of it. And now you could locate it. You could drag it out, make it a little bit bigger if you like. Let's try another one. Go back to Creo, find the very first part here. And it's on real time render too. Get it oriented to a position that you think looks good. And then go ahead and move your pointer out of the screen so it doesn't become part of the snapshot. Hold Alt and hit print screen once again. Now, Alt, the reason you hit Alt before you hit print screen and hold it down is if you have dual screens, because it's only going to capture the one screen you're working on. If you don't hold Alt, you're going to get both screens, or if you have four screens, you get all four. And then you have to crop all those additional screens out. Okay, let's go back here. Click, enter, control V is in Victor to paste. Right click on it, crop, and get that cropped as well. Now I'm gonna make some more space to fit that in there. And if you want to make it a little bit larger, you can, you can locate it. So putting these together, and you could also put in a little description. If you look at the on YouTube, I have a description of what is done in that lesson. You could go ahead and basically write in that description here. And you could say, you know, basic extrusion, cut, chamfer, or um, chamfer fillets, essentially add whatever you like. Maybe change the font, make it make, look a little different than what I have. But that 
basically concludes this exercise. Look forward to showing you exercise two, where we're going to look at revolve features and rib features. So that concludes this exercise.